Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, make sure you're subscribed because I'm gonna be giving away $10,000 to 10 lucky subscribe beautiful bastards this month. And let's just jump into it. You know, the first thing that we're gonna talk about today is about a problem that I think we all kind of hoped would go away, though realistically, we knew that it wouldn't, despite the fact that people have literally gotten killed and people have been sent to jail for doing it, and that is swatting. Where someone often from a disguise number calls 911, they say there's a shooting somewhere, usually at least uh, the ones that we end up seeing, uh, it's someone streaming content on like Twitch or YouTube. And then while that person's streaming, law enforcement busts through. And in the past 24 to 36 hours, it's happened to two massively high profile streamers in Aiden Ross and I Show Speed. And I know for some, they are polarizing figures, but whether you love them or hate them, this is not okay. Right, yesterday, Aiden Ross was doing a stream with other people and all of a sudden you see cops on camera, everyone who was joining the stream shocked by it, wondering what's happening. Though Aiden quickly realizing he was being swatted and eventually coming back to the live stream and saying, whatever troll did it, you did it. You officially did it. It's never happening ever again. Not long after that, you had I Show Speed getting handcuffed on camera while the person recording claims that he was also a victim of swatting. Oh, they swatted you, bro. They swatted you. Yeah, yeah, so much later. Yeah, we're, we're I guess. Bro, is that public? Yeah, it's, it's, I got it. Good, you good, you good, you good, bro. Bro, I didn't go, bro. Oh my yeah, God, bro. I swear I didn't do nothing. With one officer seeming to try and get the person that was streaming to step away, at one point even appearing to flip the camera over so it no longer showed I show speed. With he then in the back kind of only being able to hear just bits and pieces from the conversation. With him talking about swatting and then what I show speed was doing on his stream until officers eventually say that the camera has to turn off. Now with this instance in particular online, he was some speculating that he had not actually been swatted. With people saying that earlier in his stream that he was prank calling the police and they were simply responding to that. But there you had others saying, no, that's not what was happening. I show speed apparently has a friend labeled as 911 in his phone, and he was just calling that friend, not the real police. Right at one point, he calls this number and they respond, yo. He says 911 calling me back. Hello? Yo. And while it seemed like everyone agreed that this is wrong, it shouldn't happen, this is incredibly fucking dangerous, you did have some people wondering, is it the same person that's responsible for both of these incidents? We also saw Ross talking about the swatting after the incident on social media. Traumatizing, man. It's just scary. It's what comes with being in this position. Um, and, uh, or still in shock. And the really unfortunate and horrifying thing here is just this happening in general, yes, it is horrifying and it is traumatizing. But I really don't think it's a question of if a streamer is going to get killed from swatting, it's just when and who. Right? Because remember, these are just the latest two. With some creators having to deal with this stuff over and over again, right? XQC, for example, one of the biggest streamers in the world having to move because of constant doxing and swatting issues. And then just this morning, like this one's not getting as much traction because it's a smaller creator, but we learned that on Friday, a notable trans activist and streamer named Clara Sorrenti was actually arrested. And that, after someone impersonated her and sent out a fake email saying she killed her mother and was planning to shoot every cisgender person she saw at her local city hall. With Sorrenti obviously just completely fed up saying. During the arrest, the police officer referred to me by my dead name. I was booked in the station under my dead name. The police, when talking to my mother, referred to me as her son. Because there is no policy in my city against swatting, there is no guarantee this will not happen again and my home is not safe. Not to mention, if you've been a long time viewer of the show, we've talked about people literally being killed because of swatting. Well, we've seen in the past people responsible for this, being convicted, being sentenced, it doesn't bring that person back. But yeah, that's ultimately where we are with this story and we'll have to see what comes from here. Also, while we're talking about scary internet news, we should talk about Belle Delphine. And not because she herself is scary, though there is like 10% of my brain that thinks she, like she would smile while she stabbed someone. I don't know how to explain why I think that, but I think I don't think I'm the only one. But Belle recently popped into the news because one night with Belle Delphine, Delphine was being offered for $100,000. The description of the offering saying, spend a night with me and I will make all your fantasies come true. You can record everything that happens between us on video as a souvenir. With it then listing potential activities ranging from cultured conversation, a lunch date, all the way to explicit sexual stuff. With it also adding that you can keep the experience anonymous by using the currency called Monero. And that wasn't the only thing on the site. It also lists things like Gamer Girl P for $10,000. With the description noting there was only one jar and also you shouldn't be drinking it. It's only for sentimental purposes. But here's the thing. The reason that we're talking about this today isn't because we're talking about the further evolution of the e-girl to OnlyFans pipeline. We're talking about it because it's a scam. With this website getting enough attention and presumably duping enough people that it was a topic of discussion on the H3 podcast with everyone that was talking about it assuming that it was real. Well, she's got a new product on her website that was, sec I guess it was secretly added or quietly added, I'll say. $100,000 for one night. What do you think? With everyone discussing it, talking about how big the price tag was, wondering if people would actually spend that kind of money on something like this, until they catch on to the fact that it's not real as viewers speak up. 100% a scam, not her website. Wait, that wasn't her website? I mean, Wait, I just thought what that people was... are saying in the chat. Seriously? 
Well, that's a crazy ass scam then. And is getting enough attention that Bell herself actually addressed it in a tweet this morning writing, well this is interesting, sadly to let people know this website is fake and nothing to do with me. They also sell items you will never receive so be careful, but then adding, however don't get me wrong, I do like the idea. What do you mean by that? Rip to anyone who spent $100,000 on nothing. And yeah, that is a, I think the technical term is big oof. And I really do wonder if and if so, how many people got ripped off? That's probably unrelated. But yeah, that's the situation, and uh, really the only question I have with this story. Would you, if legal, sleep with some random internet person for $100,000? Yeah, y'all, be careful out there. If it seems too good to be true, it probably is. Also, quick side note, I've been getting a lot of people going, hey, is this you messaging me on YouTube saying, hey, call me on this WhatsApp number? That is not me. That is just the ever-growing number of scammers on this fucking platform. And then, I've got fantastic news for those of you specifically in my audience who are babies, elderly people, or women living in Colorado. Colorado, which oddly, 87% of this audience. But also for the rest of you around the country and other states, maybe you see this and you decide you want to follow suit. Because Colorado is doing away with state sales and use tax on diapers, feminine hygiene products, and adult incontinence products. And this going into effect on Wednesday after being passed with bipartisan support earlier this year, though the lawmakers who opposed the bill were all Republicans. Now as far as the specifics and why this is being done, it's meant to make the necessities we talked about more affordable for low-income people, which could provide a little help for the Colorado families who spend an average of $15 per month on period products for each member who needs them. Plus, the average $75 per month on diapers for each child, with the state estimating that consumers will save around $9.1 million annually. So whether you need tampons, pads, menstrual cups, sponges, sanitary napkins, panty liners, you name it, hopefully, fingers crossed, it's gonna be cheaper for you. Though, some who are happy the state is doing this, saying it's still not enough. Arguing that it shouldn't just be cheap, they should be free. But saying any price tag on these basic necessities is effectively a tax on women and parents. But also, of note here, this isn't the only law that Colorado has implemented this week, with others including a property tax exemption for nonprofit child care centers and up to $1,500 dollars tax credit for early childhood educators and an up to $1,000 tax credit to help older residents pay for housing. And all of that is on top of the existing products that are already exempt from state sales tax in Colorado, such as unprepared food, corrective eyeglasses, contact lenses, hearing aids, medications, including Viagra. And these new laws are just a few highlights from the list of 100 policies Governor Jared Polis and the state legislature have devised to save Coloradans money. It's just not often talked about because it's dozens of little changes which add up to a very big thing. But hey, now you know. But from that, I want to take a second to thank the fantastic sponsor of today's show, public.com slash DeFranco. You know, Public is an investing platform helping people become better investors in the public markets. And personally, I switched over to Public after I wasn't happy with one of their competitors, and I'm now in love. With Public, I get the tools and information I want through a robust community feed, and during uncertain times like these, chatting with other members and notable investors is super valuable. Plus, stock ownership unlocks content and education relevant to your portfolio from a 3 million plus strong community of investors, creators, and analysts. They've also added educational slideshows and volatility reminders to help educate you along your journey. And you can invest in a range of fractional assets on public from stocks, ETFs, crypto, coming soon, you got art and collectibles all in one place. Plus, plainly put, public puts investors first. They don't sell trades to market makers or take money from payment for order flow. Plus, for a limited time, when you sign up using public.com slash DeFranco, you'll get up to $10,000 when you transfer your account from another brokerage. With that, see additional terms and conditions of this offer by following the link in the description. But the main thing is it's public.com slash DeFranco because you should definitely start investing in your future today. And then, let's talk about Alex Jones. <laughs> Now, Alex there either needs a lozenge or he is reenacting the sound of all this money getting siphoned out of his account, right? Because where we last left things with this gross and terrible individual was the Sandy Hook defamation trial. And we talked about so many of the bizarre moments, the judge smacking him down, his lawyers being fucking stupid. And the really big news since we last talked about this is that the jury ordered Jones to pay nearly $50 million to the parents of six-year-old Jesse Lewis, who died in the shooting nearly a decade ago. And this, of course, after Jones repeatedly spread false conspiracy theories about Sandy Hook and the parents being crisis actors. And while many saw this is a massive win for the family, some thought it was still low. And that because the family was seeking $150 million. Also, another notable aspect of all this is that technically only $4 million were awarded to the parents in compensatory damages. But then, in a follow-up decision, the jury tacked on another $45 million in punitive damages, which are meant to punish defendants for particularly egregious conduct. Now, as far as if this large penalty is going to ruin or even dent Jones's business, we do know that both Infowars and its parent company, Free Speech Systems, have recently filed for bankruptcy, which, to be clear, does not actually mean that they're bankrupt they just filed for it. And during the trial, Jones claimed that damages of more than $2 million would actually sink his business. But an economist hired by the plaintiffs testified that Jones and his business are worth up to $270 million. And we got even more insight into his finances after his lawyer, like we talked about, fucked up and sent his phone's entire digital profile to the prosecution, including records that reportedly showed Infowars made as much as $800,000 per day at one point in 2018, the same year that Jones got deplatformed. And since then, the company's revenue reportedly due in part to sales for survivalist merchandise and supplements 
than over $64 million last year. And while all of this is massive news, this has now grown even bigger than Sandy Hook and Jones as well. Because since the news broke, the January 6th committee has taken an interest in his cell phone records, which are now in the hands of the plaintiff's lawyer. And if you're thinking, Alex Jones, January 6th, what was the connection there? <laughs> Right, that's Jones at the Capitol right after Trump's morning speech, telling people where the president will soon be. And then the next day on January 7th, he gets back on his show and says, The White House told me three days before, we're going to have you lead the march. The Secret Service, before Trump finishes 30 minutes before or so, will lead you to a point, take you out of the front row, and lead you to the place where they want you to start the march, and Trump will tell people, go and I'm going to meet you at the Capitol. With a reportedly later revealed that he helped organize and fund the Stop the Steal rally at which both he and Trump spoke before the Capitol riot. Which is also why late last year, the January 6th committee subpoenas him and he testifies later saying that he pled the fifth nearly 100 times. But unfortunately for him, cell phone records do not have the right to remain silent. So yesterday, the Sandy Hook parents lawyer turned over more than two years of Jones's text messages to the committee. Except fortunately for him, people familiar with the material say that the files do not include texts from the day of January 6th or the weeks leading up to it. With the most recent data reportedly being from mid 2020. And as far as what we do know they contain. Most of the nearly 250 message recipients are his employees, contractors, and family. Though some are former top Trump allies with the most prominent one we know about right now being Roger Stone. And today we found out what sort of stuff they were talking about. But as it turns out with this being from mid 2020, right? There was there a conspiracy to storm the Capitol, plans to disrupt the vote count. No. Instead, according to the lawyer, we learned that Jones reportedly sent a nude photo of his wife to Roger Stone. Jones said that there was a, an intimate photo of his wife on the phone. That I can also confirm that's true. And I normally wouldn't talk about that in public, um, but there is a public interest angle into this, mm -hmm. is that I'm a little concerned about it because that intimate photo was sent to Roger Stone. And I don't know if that was consensual. And if it wasn't consensual, and Mrs. Wolf Jones should know about that, and there might be something that needs to be done about that. Then again, it could be totally consensual. But when I see that, and I don't see any indication that it was, um, I'm, I'm concerned something might not be on the up and up with that. There are certainly laws in certain states about that. With Jones confirming the photo's existence, though Stone denies he ever received it. But ultimately, that's all we know so far. We'll see if the committee digs up anything worthwhile from those texts. But for the most part, like you can do with the information with him and Roger Stone what you will. But unless something from January 6th comes from this, at the end of the day, the real story is about the punitive damages here and the fact that, that Jones's lawyers are going to appeal. And then finally today, we need to talk about what's been dominating the headlines since yesterday afternoon, and that is the FBI's raid on former President Trump's residence at Mar-a-Lago early Monday morning. Reportedly, Trump himself was in his New York home at the time of the raid, although we didn't hear about it until the afternoon when Trump issued a statement about it. And while officially right now, we don't know why this happened, there are really only two possibilities. It's either in connection to the DOJ's investigation into January 6th and the 2020 election, or about a series of classified documents that Trump reportedly took from the White House that the National Archives wanted back. And the vast majority of people speculated that it was the latter, and his son and lawyer seemed to have confirmed that, saying that agents took out boxes of papers from the residence, and as Trump lamented in his statement, from his safe. Now, one of the big questions, why are these documents so important? Well, right now we don't fully know. All we do know is that they were possibly classified and taken without proper procedure, which is arguably a felony that could have Trump barred from running for office again. And this after at least 15 boxes of classified documents had already been found at the residence back in February. However, the reasons why this happened have been dwarfed by the conversation about its ramifications. Right, because the authorities executing a warrant on a former president's residence is unprecedented, with it leaving many bashing it as a way to remove a political opponent. And Trump himself writing that it was prosecutorial misconduct, the weaponization of the justice system, and an attack by radical left Democrats who desperately desperately don't want me to run for president in 2024, and who will likewise do anything to stop Republicans and conservatives in the upcoming midterms. And that sentiment was echoed by conservative politicians and pundits with the likes of House Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy warning, I've seen enough. The Department of Justice has reached an intolerable state of weaponized politicization. When Republicans take back the House, we will conduct immediate oversight of this department, follow the facts, and leave no stone unturned. Attorney General Garland, preserve your documents and clear your calendar. One of the biggest things that Trump and his allies tried to do is compare this to Watergate, saying things like, what is the difference between this and Watergate, where operatives broke into the the Democratic National Committee. Here, in reverse, Democrats broke into the home of the 45th President of the United States. And President Trump is right when he compared this to Watergate. This is the government using an agency to spy on a potential opponent's campaign. This is truly frightening, and it is not what our democracy stands for. But, with all this, there are a number of things that need to be cleared up. First, despite what Ron McDaniel thinks or is just publicly saying, this was not meant to spy on Trump's potential 2024 presidential campaign. That is just ridiculous. Even Trump's own lawyers have confirmed that it was linked to the top secret documents that he allegedly mishandled. Secondly, Watergate was nothing like this. That was a president hiring people to break into his opponents for political gain. This was a legal nonpartisan police raid conducted by the FBI. And there's no way that a raid on a former president wasn't approved by Director Christopher Wray, who notably is a lifelong Republican and a Trump appointee. And Biden reportedly didn't even know that the raid was going to happen. 
happen and found out about it on the news like the rest of us. With Representative Carolyn Maloney saying, Presidents have a solemn duty to protect America's national security and allegations that former President Trump put our security at risk by mishandling classified information warrant the utmost scrutiny. But all that still hasn't stopped Trump supporters from calling the execution of this search warrant a political tactic to silence an opponent. With Trump and Senator Marco Rubio warning that this tactic was used by third world countries. And saying that Biden is playing with fire by using a document dispute to get the Justice Department to persecute a likely future election opponent because one day what goes around is going to come around. And then we become Nicaragua under Ortega. And that sentiment was even picked up outside of the U.S. with the president of El Salvador asking, what would the U.S. government say if our police raided the house of one of the main possible contenders of our 2024 presidential election? But also we had people pushing back saying, yes, this is unprecedented because we've never had a president do what Donald Trump has done. Trying to stop the peaceful transfer of power, doing what he did around January 6th, taking classified documents. And others arguing that just because you are a former president or a potential political opponent, it does not suddenly make you immune to scrutiny over alleged crimes. And asking how would these politicians be held accountable if any investigation into illegal acts is suddenly an alleged tactic to silence them. But ultimately where we're at right now is you have a sizable number of conservatives now calling for the dissolution of the FBI and other intelligence agencies over this. With that, of course, just being one thing, I mean, some people are calling for the dissolution of the US or civil war. And it's not just random Twitter accounts that are saying this. We're talking about people with large followings. And while all of that is happening, you go to some of these Trump forums and you see people calling for people to take up arms, calling for violence. And quickly, this becomes something that doesn't just affect the midterms of the 2024 election, but like we're talking about potential violence here, especially with a number of these people who have large audiences saying that Trump was just the first, that you are next, which is an absolutely bizarre jump. But ultimately, that is the end of that story and today's show. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe for daily dives in the news. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.